Loving Father, we are so grateful that we can come back on this uh, uh, online platform to well meet with one another, even though it is not physical yet, Lord, it is such a ple uh, blessing and a pleasure to be able to meet with our brothers and sisters uh, on this uh, platform and we pray as we uh, discuss and talk and deliberate once again about uh, our life as a disciple of Jesus and uh, the desire for us to learn. We ask you to help us to continue to grow in the knowledge and certainly the grace of our Lord Jesus. That's so very important, Father, is may these studies be uh, a catalyst for us to learn more and to dig more into the scriptures. We commit this uh, time into your hands and asking you for your guidance and certainly the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, uh, today we uh, will continue what I have started some time back, the story of the church, church history. And we are coming up to, well, a thousand years of church history. We are moving into now the next uh, next uh, millennium, actually. Uh, so we will discuss today, the, 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 the topic is the great schism. The church schism means division or split. Uh, and uh, let me bring up uh, my, uh, my slides on the screen, and I will show you a few of these slides, which will uh, be able to give you a little bit more uh, understanding of uh, the subject. So as you see, uh, the, the, the title of the message is the great schism of the church, the topic rather today, all right? And uh, uh, those of you who are not on mute, may I request you to put yourselves on mute for now, and we can open it up later because there was some, uh, some kind of a disturbing noise coming in. So thank you very much for uh, uh, doing that. All right, and uh, what we will discuss is also obviously the theological issues that went into this great split and uh, I don't think it is enough for us to just discuss history. And uh, of course, we want to know the theological perspectives behind it. But what are the lessons we can learn? Well, how does it speak to us today? You know, there's no point in uh, rehashing history and not recognizing how does it affect us or what is it that we must take away from uh, this particular, uh, you know, situation that took place in the church, okay? So first we'll look at the history uh, and then we will look at uh, the other issues. Okay, uh, let me just move on to the next slide. I hope you can all see my slides. Uh, this date, July 6, 1054 AD, uh, you will notice that we have already moved into the next millennium. Uh, this is the date on which you could say the split took place, even though this, the, 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 the split was building up even from an early age, maybe even hundreds of years. Uh, but this is the time when finally the split took place, as it says, the divide between the Western and Eastern Christian churches. And the split continues to this day. All right. Just to give you a perspective on this Western and Eastern, I think... Um, uh, you know, you already know that the Roman Empire had its capital in the city of Rome, but when uh, Constantine, the emperor, uh, became, uh, you know, took over the reins of the empire, he moved to uh, a place called Constantinople, uh, which was named after him, actually. Uh, the it was earlier uh, Byzantium. It was uh, called Byzantium. And when Constantine moved to Byzantium, he renamed the city as Constantinople after himself, Constantine. If you 
uh, want to know the geography of this. Uh, Constantinople is modern day Istanbul in Turkey, right? So that is uh, where the Eastern Church still has its, you could say, headquarters. Um, so the church had a presence, you could say, in a, a look like a like a like a, a operational headquarters in Rome first. And then things moved to Constantinople, right? Now, theological differences began to appear and emerge, not only theological, there were other issues, which we will discuss in just a moment. But what happened was there continued to build up a mistrust between, you could say, Constantinople and Rome. Uh, and a mistrust and a desire to, uh, to maintain basically ecclesiastical power, right? Uh, many scholars feel this was actually the reason why the church split. Even though they mentioned theological issues, but it was more... Uh, egoistical in terms of uh, the fight between these two. And if I can draw you to uh, the screen, the central figures that finally, you know, uh, brought the split to full force was the patriarch of Constantinople. His, his name was Michael Cerularius and Leo the uh, the, 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 ni the ninth, who was the bishop or the pope in Rome. If you notice, the, um, the head of the church in Constantinople are normally called patriarchs, and the head of the church in Rome is normally called the pope. Or uh, at that particular point in time, he was the bishop in Rome. All right, so these two are the key figures who finally brought the uh, problems, you know, to the ways, to the, to the fore. Uh, so like I said, mistrust began to grow between these two uh, individuals. Along with them, they roped in other bishops and other, you know, uh, people of the church. And uh, they decided that they will no more work together and no more be one church and that they will uh, move ahead towards splitting up the church. And so once again, I'm cutting through a lot of information. I just want to bring up the main points. What happened was a mutual excommunication took place in uh, 1054. In other words, the patriarch of Constantinople uh, excommunicated the Bishop of Rome and, and vice versa, the Bishop of Rome excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople. So the mutual excommunication basically, uh, you know, resulted in both the churches going their own way. So the Western church is represented by the Bishop of Rome and the Patriarch of Constantinople represents the Eastern church today called the Eastern Orthodox Church. Okay. Uh, so when this took place, when the mutual excommunication took place, this gave rise to the Roman Catholic Church uh, headed by the Pope in Rome and the Eastern Orthodox Church headed by the Patriarch of Constantinople. All right, so that is the great schism that we talk about in church history, right? Um, so what happened after that? I mean, there were attempts to reconcile, but uh, all attempts failed and they decided that they will not get into uh, any, any more dialogue or discussion to bring the churches together. Uh, they decided that they will go like, a, you know, which uh, they, they're separate ways, which continues to this day. So let me see, the Western Church or the Roman Catholic Church 
expanded into the Americas as time went on into the centuries ahead, uh, Latin America, uh, and of course, uh, to some extent, North America. Uh, but of course, the British, then the Anglican Church took over uh, the, no the North American continent. But the Catholic Church expanded into these places and, and of course, other places, even in India, uh, the Portuguese uh, came first, you know, as the Catholic Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church expanded into the Balkans, as we call them, and into Russia. Balkans will include countries like uh, Greece, Macedonia, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Slovenia, today's Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, all these places form the Balkans. And the Eastern Orthodox Church basically expanded into, into, that, into that area. And of course, to some extent, the Middle East, we still have the patriarchs there, the, you know, the Syrian Orthodox Church, who finally uh, uh, you know, established their presence even in India. So the Syrian Orthodox Church in Kerala still exists today. I uh, just wanted to mention over the years, they remained separate, but in the recent past, as early as 1965, there were some uh, attempts for reconciliation between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics. Uh, 1965 was one of those attempts where Pope Paul VI and the Orthodox Patriarch Athenagoras, uh, these two tried to come together, but uh, at least there was some dialogue, but then uh, they did not uh, take it further. Another attempt in March 1991, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the World Alliance of Reformed Churches uh, reached a consensus. In other words, one of, the, one of the reasons or theological reasons they separated on, they decided to bury, they decided to put aside and not really take that forward. But that was only one issue they resolved, but they could not uh, you know, reconcile completely. And I was just reading that uh, a theologian by name, Thomas Torrance, uh, is, uh, is, was instrumental in this dialogue between the Eastern Orthodox and the World Alliances of Reformed Churches. Uh, and some of you might know the that uh, Thomas Torrance is one person that we uh, refer to quite often uh, because he is one of those who popularized Trinitarian theology. And so we, um, uh, I thought I'll mention that name since some of you might recognize it. One more attempt in 1995, Patriarch Bartholomew of the Eastern Orthodox Church met with Pope John Paul II and in their meeting, the excommunication was lifted. In other words, they decided that they will no more hold on to the excommunication. All right. Uh, but unfortunately, though they both decided they will lift the excommunication, uh, full reconciliation is yet uh, not yet a reality. Okay, so that is some of the history behind the schism. Uh, and Maybe I should just mention, I always thought that the Roman Catholic Church, and they claim that they are the original church, but, but I, you know, I beg to differ. They, are exist, they, they came into existence only a thousand years after the apostles. So uh, uh, the, the original church was the Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church, but it was... Uh, you know, the church that existed together, both East and West, but now the split was very, very apparent. All right, so giving you some of the history there, let's move to the theological issues. Um, there are a few, but most notable of the theological issues is something called the filioque controversy, all right? Uh, in Latin, the filioque controversy, or some people pronounce it as filioque controversy, whatever. Um, 
what the filioque controversy is the inclusion or the uh, understanding about the procession of the Holy Spirit. You see, in the Nicene Creed back in uh, 325 AD, they mentioned that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. All right. Uh, but the Western Church, which is now the Roman Catholic Church, uh, let me see. Uh, they affirm that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. In other words, they affirm a double procession. While the Eastern Church, represented by the Eastern Orthodox Church, they taught that the Holy Spirit proceeds solely from God the Father. Right? This was a huge controversy. And uh, the, East, the Roman Catholic Church even went on to uh, what do you edit the Nicene Creed by adding that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both God the Father and God the Son. Uh, so that was the controversy. They couldn't come to any uh, understanding on that. or um, uh, So they decided that they will maintain their theological position on that. Now, uh, I'm just once again uh, reducing all of it into, you know, uh, one, uh, just, just mentioning it. I'm not doing a study on it. But what is the GCI position today? And I thought that must be important for us. How do we understand this particular controversy? Does the Holy Spirit proceed from both God the Father and God the Son? Or does the Holy Spirit proceed only from God the Father? Right. In that respect, let me read to you a verse just to show how we have decided or what is our position as GCI on this particular, uh, you know, subject? I'm reading from John chapter 14 and verse 15, uh, 15 to 17. And here the, uh, the, it reads from verse 15. If you love me, this is Jesus Christ uh, talking, you will keep my commandments. Verse 16 then says, and I will ask the father. And he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you do know him for he abides with you and will be in you. We um, looking at this subject from this particular scripture. We decided. Uh, as our position concerning the procession of the Holy Spirit to be the following, and I'm going to put it on the screen and read it for you so that uh, you will understand our position. Let me read the, uh, our position uh, based on John 14, the scripture that I just read. Here it says, while some doctrinal formulations, including some forms of the Nicene Creed, say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, the GCI statement of beliefs state that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. Okay. Continuing, GCI accepts both formulations as valid representations of the biblical teaching concerning the Spirit when properly understood. These statements should not be taken in such a way as to either call into question the unity of the being of the one triune God or the full divinity of the Son, nor regard the Holy Spirit as a second Son. So that is our position. <laughs> uh, some heavy theological uh, you know, concepts there. But what we believe is the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, which remains, uh, I would say, faithful to the scripture in 
uh, John chapter 14, the gospel of John chapter 14, where Jesus Christ prays, I will ask the father, he says, and he will give you another advocate, the spirit of truth. So there are both the father and the son are involved in the procession of the spirit. But the way Jesus Christ words it uh, seem to indicate that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father, but through the son. It is Christ who then makes that available. So that is how we would like to term it. And we wouldn't want to find a controversy there. So we believe that the participation of both father and son is involved in the procession of the spirit. But we have to be careful that we don't say that the procession of the Holy Spirit is from the father as though just like the son begotten of the father, it almost seems like the Holy Spirit is a second son and we don't want to make that mistake. All right. So I leave uh, that discussion there and move on to other theological issues. If you once again have a question on that, we can discuss it as we move on. Let me go to other theological issues that led to the split of the church between Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. Another controversy was the veneration of religious icons. This is something that kept building up over, I would say, centuries. Uh, the leaders in the East, Eastern Orthodox Church, went through periods of banning icons and replacing them with the cross. But then they would again allow, so they went back and forth with regards to veneration of icons. And if you remember, we did a study on this, I think sometime back. But it, the Western church, that is the Roman Catholic church was always in favor of religious icons. Uh, so this was, though not the most important uh, theological issue regarding the split that led to the split, but this was one of those that kept coming up with regards to uh, the fight between the East and the West. So that is one more theological issue to add. And uh, 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 another one was the celibacy of priesthood. See, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, priests could marry, but in the Roman Catholic Church, priests had to commit to celibacy. That means that they could not get into the priesthood if they were married, or once they got into the priesthood, uh, they were not supposed to marry. And so that is uh, another controversy that they discussed and could not come to uh, a, uh, a common platform on this. There is one more theological issue. And once again, I am condensing this to these few. Maybe there were others, but uh, uh, in terms of theology, another point of uh, contention was the communion bread. See, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they said the bread must only be leavened bread with yeast in it. Can you imagine the kind of problems that they tried to fight on? They said that the, the bread must be leavened with yeast. But in the West, that is the Roman Catholic Church, priests could serve communion with unleavened bread. So I think in the Roman Catholic Church, they didn't bother much. But then uh, the Eastern Church was very fastidious on... Uh, the composition of the communion bread. So that was another controversy. And along with that, I should also say, in the East, the church allowed the bread to be dipped in the communion wine. But uh, the Roman Catholic Church apparently does not allow the bread to be dipped in the wine. I don't know if some of you might have some more thoughts on that. I'll be happy to hear from you, but this was apparently one of those issues, theological issues that led to finally the split. Now, and remember, I, I just mentioned theological issues, but there were other issues. And let me just move on to that. What were the other issues that brought the split of the church? Uh, other issues that 
not were not strictly theological was rejection of papal authority. Uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church with its bishop in Rome or the Pope, they call them the Pope in Rome, they believed that the apostolic authority was in Rome. Okay. Uh, they, uh, you know, believed that the Pope was the successor to Peter, the apostle. And the Pope derives his authority from uh, Peter. And hence, the papal authority was the final. That is how the Roman Catholic Church today believes it. Why do they say that? Because they would quote scriptures like, the keys of the kingdom was given to Peter. All right. And hence, Peter is the rightful authority, uh, you know, uh, that they would claim to have the leadership of the church. In fact, there was also some discussion on the Pope becoming the vicar of, vicar of Peter. Vicar means in place of. And later, even though they said vicar of Peter, in other words, in place of Peter, they went on to even say, that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, <laughs> which means to say that uh, the Pope represents Jesus Christ sitting on his apostolic throne. So that is uh, how the Roman Catholic Church believed in papal authority. Uh, but the Eastern Church rejected this and they said, sorry, uh, we don't, we don't uh, you know, consider the, the Bishop of Rome to be the ultimate authority, but the Patriarch of Constantinople is our authority. And so the split took place because of that also. And one more thought before I move on, Rome versus Constantinople. In other words, along with the theological issues and the rejection of authority, even geopolitical issues began to play a role or, uh, in the uh, split of the church. Rome for the Roman Catholic Church was more important than Constantinople, which was uh, where the patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church was. So each one claimed preeminence. They believed Rome was the rightful place for the headquarters of the church, and uh, while the Eastern Orthodox claimed Constantinople. So the whole problem was geopolitical in nature. Uh, and of course, once again, like I said earlier, uh, and many believe that uh, these, some of these issues are probably more prominent in the split of the church. So that is basically what went on behind the scenes with regards to the split of the church into the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. I just want to now complete uh, my presentation today by just very briefly talking about lessons. What are the lessons we should take away from this? Once again, these are something that I uh, just tried to conjure up, uh, looking at the history and the theological issues. Uh, they, they, they may be debatable, uh, but I would be happy to hear some of your thoughts uh, with regards to maybe some more lessons we can learn. One lesson I believe that we can learn from uh, what has happened in 1054 AD when the church split is that the church is not perfect. All right. um, I think we have said this many a times and it's very unfortunate that some people still think that, uh, you know, the churches uh, are perfect or their church is the only perfect church. Uh, but History proves that the church on the earth, as it is today, uh, is filled with, you know, as the Apostle Paul says, wrinkles and spots. <laughs> uh, the church is not perfect. And if you read the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, where it talks about these various churches that existed in Asia Minor, uh, very clearly proves that the church had many, many problems. Uh, they were uh, battling various kinds of issues within themselves and without themselves. You know, there were false teachings in the church. 
there was legalism in the church. In other words, rejecting Christ as the only one who uh, is the author of salvation. Uh, there was spiritual abuse in the church, which still happens today. So the church is not perfect. That is one thing we can learn uh, from this church history, that we shouldn't try to think that we can somewhere, somehow, somewhere find a perfect church. Uh, like somebody said, if you found the perfect church, the moment you joined it, it became imperfect because you're not perfect. <laughs> That's what some people like to say. Secondly, I would like to think that history is a warning so that we don't repeat our same, the same problems. But then <laughs> that's exactly what we do, don't we? Uh, uh, though, we learn, though we have historical precedents and records, and yet many a times we are condemned to repeat that the, the, the sordid part of history, all right? But I think history in one sense is a warning and even the Bible says so, that these things were written for our learning and I feel that there is a need for us to look into history and to see where the problems were so that we may try to avoid them uh, you know, in our fellowships. Uh, history shows things can go terribly wrong. You know? uh, and when things go wrong, we need to find a way to deal with those problems. But unfortunately, history shows that the way some of them, the leaders especially, dealt with the problems were not, uh, you know, uh, were not ideal and obviously led to many, many problems. Perhaps history is helping us to understand that we must, uh, we must respect diversity. We must uh, not allow differences to, to split us, to divide us. But unfortunately, that is something that we still continue to battle with. History is helping us understand that when we have differences, when we have diversity, uh, it's an opportunity to learn from one another. But uh, rather, we sometimes allow these uh, differences or diversity to, uh, to split us. And some have even abandoned the faith because of that. And so maybe history is helping us recognize, let us not abandon the faith uh, just because of some issues uh, that come about, that crop up in our fellowships. So that is one thought I'd like to leave you with. A third one is what we understand and learn is that God does not abandon the church in its imperfections. Uh, no one can say God does not work in the Catholic Church like one particular, uh, you know, person wrote as a comment to one of my messages long back that, uh, that uh, God does not work in an imperfect church. Uh, well, God can even work with pagan empires, you know, even non-Christian people. God is not limited. And I think one of the things we can learn is that God does not abandon the church in its imperfections. And I would like to say that this is proved in the scriptures. Revelation 2 and 3 proves that. We have churches with various imperfections. Now the church, God disciplines the church. God can bring uh, a certain sense of discipline. And God is always pleading for people to return to the faith, return to their first love. And we read that in Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, but God still remains, uh, you know, faithful to his, uh, to his uh, leading the church. But he allows us, you know, that sense of uh, or the freedom to decide. And uh, we can perhaps from this understand that though we as individuals are imperfect and we today are the temple of God, we live in imperfection. All we have to see is look at our lifestyle. There are so many things that may not be right about how we live, but let us not be, uh, let me say, uh, you know, tempted to think that God leaves us. No, he never, he does not abandon us. He 
will never leave us nor forsake us as the book of Hebrews tells us. Though we are imperfect, we can be absolutely sure that God has not abandoned us. It is we who have probably moved away and it is for us to come back, you know, in close proximity to God and God allows for that. So a larger lesson for us to learn, not only the church in its corporate structure, but also as individuals, as individual temples of God in our imperfection, you know, we can always find forgiveness with God. We can always find the doors open so that we may move towards God. God is most willing to receive us uh, when we, you know, continue to struggle with our own issues. One more thought, and then I will close the study for today. And this is something, a larger perspective that I would like to just, uh, uh, just uh, sort of leave with you. Church governance. This uh, lesson from history, the, uh, the split that took place in 1054, I think uh, highlights, or maybe I could say that gives us an opportunity to reflect on the subject of church governance. Now, in the scriptures, we don't have, you know, the apostle Paul or Peter or any one of the apostles telling us that the way we have governance in the church is this, and they never spell it out. I suppose in different times and different ages, we, we had various types of church governance. We had authoritarian or congregational, which is more democratic. We in GCI would like to adopt the team-based, right? Uh, uh, I, would, I would like to say that we, we model our church governance on the Trinitarian model. The Trinitarian model is team-based, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are all involved in, uh, you know, uh, in our lives. Uh, so the reason I say this is uh, we must think about good church governance. A healthy church must have good governance. And uh, it should not be stifling. It should not be authoritarian. It should not be majoritarian, which is the democratic. And I don't think church governance necessarily have to be major majoritarian. But it should be something where we have a genuine desire to find God's will to lead us in everyday you know, life of the church. We have one leader of the church, and that is Jesus Christ. Under him, we have the team. We might have various offices, but we must uh, be, be respectful of those offices. But then uh, uh, we try to model healthy church governance, not toxic. Some, some church governance have a very toxic perspective, and some people are tremendously abused in, in some of the forms or styles of church governance. And we must be careful about that. And so um, the fact that the split took place, maybe uh, it is something for us to reflect on how do we deal with these problems? What kind of a governance do we have so that we can deal with these problems and not abandon you know, the larger fellowship uh, unnecessarily? All right, so I will stop, uh, just take off the sharing and bring you all back on board. <laughs> I'm going to stop there uh, and allow you to maybe mention some of the lessons that maybe you, you feel can we can learn from uh, what we've just discussed. Any questions or comments you'd like to make? So let me open the floor for that. Go ahead. Anil, go ahead. Uh, what are the what are the scriptures, uh, scriptural references that the Catholic Church uh, uses to support its belief, particularly about the Holy Spirit and uh, celibacy and all those things? That is my first question. And second is, you mentioned the last, the church governance should be not authoritarian, not 
and authoritarian versus congregation versus uh, team. What is the difference between congregation and team based? Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Are. Well, uh, with regards to the first question, obviously, you know, I we, we don't have the time to look at all of the arguments that goes into believe, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church forming their doctrine about the Holy Spirit. Uh, that will take a long time. Uh, but uh, I'm presuming that uh, that since Jesus Christ and God the Father, God the Father and God the Son, uh, the mention of, you know, I read John 14, perhaps they take that, I don't know. I, like I said, I, I must confess that I have not done a study on the Roman Catholic arguments for the double procession. The Eastern Orthodox believes only the, the procession from the Father, but the Roman Catholic Church believes that it is a double procession from the Father and the Son. Uh, I'm presuming that since uh, both are deity, Father and Son are deity, so they want to include both and not just isolate the, uh, the, 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 the Father. Once again, um, if uh, we should, you know, should be interested, maybe we can do a study on that. But I'll just leave it at that because once again, I don't want to say something which might not necessarily be uh, true to their Catholic belief. You were coming to the second point. Uh, was there any other point in the first question, uh, Anil? Uh, no, that's okay. Okay. The second point is, well, you know, various church, there are various types of church governance. And uh, like I said, the Bible does not black and white prescribe a particular church governance. Uh, but what we have believed is we take the team base. Now, there is the authoritarian. For example, the Roman Catholic Church is authoritarian. One leader, one person is the final authority in terms of, uh, uh, you know, setting doctrine. Uh, and there are various other churches, mega churches believe in that one person. We were authoritarian, WCG. Herbert Armstrong was a final authority with everything, right? He set all the policies of the church uh, and you could not argue against that. My, uh, the congregational is more democratic. In other words, the congregation as a whole is involved in governance and it's more of a democracy. Now, we in GCI believe a democracy probably is not the best. We believe that just because the majority believes in something, it doesn't necessarily make it correct mm -hmm. or biblical. We believe that we must have a council of elders, and that's where we come with the team based. Okay. And, uh, right? And then we have a consultative decision making. We don't have just one person forcing everything down everybody else's throat. So we have more consultative church governance, which we believe is more Trinitarian. And our focus on Trinitarian theology br brings us to this, uh, to this form of church governance. In short, I'd like to leave it there, but if you, there is a whole, we oh, can, go, right. <laughs> yeah, we can do a right. study on church governance. Yeah. I was basically wanting to know the congregation and the team base. Right. That was the difference I couldn't make. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. If I can just mention the team based is more seeking God's will, but the congregational is, you know, do a vote and the majority <laughs> wins. <laughs> uh, we don't necessarily believe in that. Correct. Okay. Any, any other lessons you can think of from the split that took place? Now it is coming up to a thousand years, actually. Yes, Sore Murthy, go ahead. Uh, Sore Murthy, could you please unmute yourself? We can't hear you yet. The splits have taken place. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. The splits have taken place on theoretical matters. Whether Holy Spirit proceeded from Father are from Jesus Christ. As an individual, what is important to us is how we practically conduct ourselves. 
irrespective of the fact whether we know the right thing or wrong thing, theoretically, in practice, we know how to how we should conduct ourselves as Christians, how we should relate ourselves to God. I think this is most important. Whatever may be the theory of theoretical aspects, whether the bread should be dipped in wine, or these are something theoretical. Correct. Practical, practical aspects are very clear. Yes. So there should not be. Yes, I think, uh, Surimurthy, what you are touching upon is probably a very, very important point, you know, I think, uh, and thank you for bringing it up. Uh, you know, I think we, the churches have uh, fought over and split over unnecessary, you know, peripheral things. Uh, we have always believed there are core beliefs of the church, which we don't compromise on, but there are many other uh, secondary uh, peripheral beliefs, which unfortunately gets highlighted and focused. The focus becomes so strong that we are we uh, you know forget the fact, like you said, what how should we conduct ourselves as disciples of Jesus? And I think uh, we have failed in that way uh, to a large extent. And uh, and so what you're saying, Surimurti, I think is uh, very important that. We, even though we can have differences in our belief system, for example, you know, uh, there are those WCG members who would like to keep the Sabbath today, and that is no issue for us, you know. Uh, uh, but we don't have to split the church over that, right? Uh, but then there are those who believe in it so passionately that they would like that. Uh, to say that those who don't and then make judgments and that becomes the problem. And I feel we must avoid that. We must understand the primary and the core with regards to the peripheral and the secondary. Does that make sense? Anyone have any thoughts to add to that? Yes, sir. Franklin, you have a thought uh, to add? So yes, sir. We, uh, we agree with you wholeheartedly and fully. Thank you, Franklin. Yeah. If I can just also say while you're thinking of other comments, you know, we in GCI, I don't think each one of us, every one of us will have identical beliefs. In fact, we shouldn't in one sense. There must be some diversity and that brings a richness. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you know, we must uh, be diverse on core subjects. You know, if we say that, if we start, let's, for example, uh, debating about the divinity of Jesus, then of course, uh, then we have a problem because that is, uh, or the resurrection of Jesus, you know, if, if that is uh, debated, then that, there is a problem. And like today, there are many who are, uh, you know, they say they are Christian, but don't believe in a bodily resurrection of, the, of Christ. Now that can become a problem. <clears throat> All right. Yes, Veronica, go ahead. I just noticed your uh, digital hand. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say that uh, in I have seen some changes in the churches. Like I was not noticing before but from the time like I have joined this group of uh, this group and I have learned so many things and I used to read bibles also with my with my mother yeah. so after learning and knowing so many things I have seen that in my our time we used to do bible classes uh, sisters and fathers used to do for us but now time now the time has changed and like anybody can do the bible classes for, for the children and like for confessions and all that also we used to do to fathers but from my point of view like we should not confess our sins to the fathers like we should go to directly to jesus oh heavenly father and we should confess our sins directly to them so i think that those things little bit changes are there which is wrong 
Okay. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Let me just clarify. Uh, you are saying that confessing to the uh, to a priest, like a, uh, you're a, a Roman Catholic priest, is yes. wrong, but you must confess it to God the Father. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I must mention that um, uh, the way the Roman Catholic Church uh, conducts its confession confessions is... I don't know, once again, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you don't confess it to the, to, to the priest in the church, then your sins are not yet forgiven. That I will not accept because forgiveness comes from God Almighty, you know, and so confessing it to God the Father is correct, like you said. I may hasten to mention that the Bible does talk about confessing your sins one to another. Amen. All right. Now, that is a different, uh, I would say, it is not the same league as what we are discussing in terms of forgiveness from the God the Father. Confessing is basically when we do wrong to others, uh, when we have a problem and we can seek support from another. It is more in terms of seeking a sense of support rather than forgiveness. So if, uh, uh, if I can just mention that, just to make a distinction between the two. I hope I'm not confusing you. If you have any thought on that, please come back to us, uh, Veronica. Uh, but uh, if like sometimes even the priests also do mistakes and even they do wrong things, but like if we are telling to them, they might like, you know, think something else or they might know our secrets or something. So maybe they are not comfortable then like. Yes. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there are uh, many things that, uh, you know, we can only confess to God and God already knows even before you confess. And uh, our forgiveness comes from God. And, uh, and sometimes it is very embarrassing to go to a human priest and then uh, do these confessions because, uh, once again, I'm not exactly sure of uh, uh, their policy. Uh, but, yeah, they talk about unless you confess, your sins are not forgiven. If that is the case, then obviously I think there is a problem. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's an interesting thought. <laughs> right. <clears throat> any of you would like to speak to um, into any of the comments made so far? Please feel free because there's so much we can learn from each other. Are you going to, at a later date, take take up the second split between Catholics and Protestants? Yes, in fact, <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church then went on to split to become Protestant. Uh, yes, we will discuss that. Uh, uh, maybe there will be one or two more subjects before we come to that. That's another 500 years later. Uh, yes. And then I would like to complete the series by then talking about the modern day church. Uh, maybe some thoughts on that. But yes, uh, the Roman, the Protestant Reformation is an important aspect of church history. Very good. I think uh, we have done good time. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, yeah. why the East and the Eastern Church and the Western Church have difficulty in reconciling their differences? Well, <laughs> 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 because of and all that, yeah. I How think we are just too human. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, we, we are too afraid, you know, that we will concede too much. And I think that is, that is always the problem. Some people don't want to give up power. See, uh, if, if the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox reconcile, who will be the head of the church? <laughs> and both will not want to concede. And that, I think, is the problem. <laughs> probably the main problem. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if the theological issues really matter. And like I, like I mentioned earlier, the excommunication has been lifted. And also, I think uh, uh, even the filioque controversy, procession of the Holy Spirit, is no more an issue any, you know, in the church now. But geopolitical power situations, governance issues are the main problem. So two sincere efforts were made, no, sir, in 1965 and, and again in 1980s. That's correct. Uh, but it, 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 they, could, it, they could not succeed. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. 
So this problem continues even to, till today, sir. <laughs> sir, uh, why are Russia, sir, Russia and Ukraine both? If I can digress, sir, Russia believes in the Bible. They believe they are Christians. Ukrainians are Christians. They believe in the Bible, and they are not able to live as brothers. <laughs> oh, good. <goodness. laughs> yeah, Christians <laughs> killing Christians. You know that is uh, what what a what a horrible example we are. But yes. Uh, <laughs> The Orthodox Church, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Russian Orthodox Church don't get along. And uh, uh, their patriarchs have had a problem with each other. I don't know uh, all the ins and outs of it, but that is what they say. But yes, it's, it's unfortunate, but it happens. Buddy, do you had a thought? Yes, please go ahead, Bert. Uh During the course of this Bible study, did anybody notice me slipping to the ground, my my the my chair leg uh, cracked and broke, and I was on the ground. Did anybody notice it? And when I was on the ground. No. I, I, uh, I wish I had. I, I wish I had, but even I didn't. Ah, uh, we I thought. When I went to the floor. I quickly uh, closed my you know yeah. went off. The video, went off the video. Did anybody notice? I thought. No. Uh, I did notice that you shut off your uh, video and I thought maybe you were getting yourself a cup of tea, but I didn't know that you fell on the ground. <laughs> right. I hope you're okay though. I'm okay, yeah, nothing except a loss of a chair. <laughs> <laughs> two chairs. Okay. Uh, two chairs either side of the table. Now I'm figuring out how one is gone, it's broken. Right. And, uh, yeah, this, uh, you know, <laughs> this chairs look sturdy, but uh, yet... You reduce somehow. your weight, man. <laughs> <laughs> reduce your weight. Lose weight. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need to lose weight, yes. yes. <laughs> or, or we can all contribute for a second chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. On that note, uh, I think we are almost out of time. Maybe if, as we close, <laughs> let me just mention uh, that uh, we are having a a convention celebration, a church convention celebration in uh, Lonavla, October 28th to the 30th. So uh, those of you who would like to join, uh, please feel free to come over and uh, we would love to have you join us. If you're able to travel and join us, please come over. Uh, right. Today, 5th October is the deadline to, yes. uh, to, uh, to send in a registration forms. Yes, uh, th there is an online registration form you should, which you can fill in. But if there should be any problems, please co contact Praveen in case even you are not able to do it by the deadline. Please contact him. I'm sure he'll be able to help you. All right. Having said that, uh, may I request, uh, Vanessa, if you are comfortable, can I request you to close in prayer? I am not sure if Vanessa heard me. She's not un unmuted. Okay. Uh, probably uh, having problem online. Uh, Vincent, since your uh, connection is good, may I request you to please close in prayer? What? <laughs> yes, Pastor? I'm sorry, okay. Vanessa. Uh, I, I thought you could close in prayer, but I've asked Vincent. That's okay. Next time you can do it. So we will ask Vincent to close in prayer. Thank you. Okay. My internet connection had gone off. Okay. okay. Right. Almighty God, Father in heaven, thank you so very much for this time. You were with us, guiding us through the history of the church. Help us remember, Almighty God, though we may be in different parts of the world, Help us to be one, united under Jesus Christ, instead of splitting up. Help us that we conduct ourselves the way you want us to conduct, so that your holy name will be glorified. Bless each one of us, our family members. Help us, keep us in good health. Provide for us all that we 
need. And bless our sleeping, bless our waking, bless our work, bless everything that you have given us, our intellect, and especially your holy words that we need to remember. We pray all these things, O oh God, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for joining us. God bless you all, and we look forward to seeing you soon.